Are you looking to become a better real estate investor? Then hang on because you're about to experience another episode of the world's most popular real estate podcast, The Bigger Pockets Podcast. But before we get to this week's show, I wanted to invite you to become part of our community, biggerpockets.com, the real estate investing social network. The membership is free and you'll instantly gain access to networking opportunities, educational content, investor tools, and more. Sign up now and get a free copy of our book, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing, read by hundreds of thousands of budding entrepreneurs. Just click this link right here or just head to biggerpockets.com. With that, let's get to the show. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 81. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host, the man, the myth. It's Brandon Turner. Hey, what's up? What's up, Brandon? How are you? I'm good. Hey, I got a serious question for you. Very serious. Oh, oh yeah? yeah? What's up? Yeah. What is your favorite movie? My favorite movie? Ooh, that's a tough one because it's fresh in my mind. I'm going to say Shawshank Redemption. Oh, okay. That's a good movie. But, but uh, yeah, it's, that's one of them. How about you? That Thing You Do, Tom Hanks movie. from. Oh, the, stop. Yeah. I love that movie. Is that really your favorite movie? That is my all-time favorite movie. I learned to play drums because of that That movie. actually says a lot about you. Okay. You <laughs> it, it, it's all starting to make sense now, yep. man. It's all starting to make sense. I was destined to be a rock star. And I uh, ended up here. I had faith in you, and it just keeps <laughs> dropping. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, that is a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Thanks. And, uh, we, people want to know, so that's why, you know. Yeah. All right, yeah. enough about us. Yeah. Let's get on to the interview. Yeah, let's do it. All right, guys. So today we, we, we have a really, really great show. Today uh, we actually have a follow-up from our show 77. Uh, today's show is with Michael Quarles. And uh, we wanted to have him back because we didn't quite have enough time to delve into all the topics that we wanted to delve into last time. And those topics are on the subject of marketing. And we'll get into that in a second. But before we do, let's get into today's quick, quick tip. tip. All right. Today's quick tip is Bigger Pockets File Place. If you are not aware, we have a place on the site called, called the Bigger Pockets File Place. You go to biggerpockets.com slash files, F I L E S. And there you can find all sorts of files. You can find uh, spreadsheets and forms and, and agreements. And ultimately, it's your peers sharing documents that they've put together to help them with their business and, and they're, they're putting it out there to, sh to share with you. So definitely check it out. You'll get lots of ideas. Definitely do not just go and use a contract. If somebody put a contract up there, we would absolutely recommend you, you run anything by your attorney before you ever use it. So uh, you know, just be careful on that stuff. But definitely uh, be sure to take a look and see what's out there. There's, there's a lot of great things. Cool. All right. And yeah, by the way, if you're a regular free Bigger Pockets member, you can download three a week. Uh, if you're a plus, you can download five a week. And if you're a pro member, you can download as many as you want. And that is our pro benefit of the week. So check it out. Upgrade to pro biggerpockets.com slash pro and you can get download unlimited files every single week. So with that, let's bring in Michael. You want to introduce him? Yeah. So really quick, Michael is an active investor out of California. Uh, he specializes in wholetailing. He's done a ton of these wholetail deals. Uh, it's kind of a cool strategy. Again, we talked about it back in show 77, so definitely check that out. He's also the owner of uh, yellowletters.com. It's this monster direct mail company, and he's definitely one of the brighter minds out there on the topic of marketing and direct mail, which is why we really wanted to have him back because the last show we talked about negotiation and not direct mail. So here we are. <laughs> We're back. We're on show 81, and we're going to talk to you guys about direct mail and marketing. And there's a ton of really, really great information in this one. I know I say it a lot, but you know, break out your pens and take notes on this one because you're going to get a lot. So with that, let's bring him in. All right, Michael, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you again. It is absolutely great to be here. If this is half as fun as the last one, I'm just going to go home after this <laughs> and relax. Yeah, the last show the last show was a lot of fun. Um, people really liked that. Definitely one of our most popular shows we've done. And uh, because of that, 
that is why you're back so soon. I mean, usually we wait a year between people, but last time we had like this list of what, like 50 questions that I wanted to ask you. Like yep. I kind of wrote up this list and, uh, yeah, got to the end in, of our interview and we had done like six questions. <laughs> and so uh, we we definitely want to explore more of those topics today, especially on the topic of marketing. And that's why we're bringing you back so soon. We're so. about a month out and we've had well over 30,000 yeah. folks l- listen to your show, which is... Uh, is that good or bad? That's good. That's, that's 30,000 listeners is uh, <laughs> slightly, slightly above our average. and But uh, it's yeah, a popular show. Yeah. So why don't we just uh, why don't we start with a recap? Because not everyone would have listened to the last show. So uh, those people and, who haven't. And that was, by the way, that was show seventy seven of the Bigger Pockets podcast, and you could find that at biggerpockets.com slash show seventy seven. Yeah. So definitely listen to that after you're done with this one if you haven't listened to that one yet. But uh, uh, those people who haven't heard that, why don't you give us like a two minute recap of like what do you? I mean, how did you get started, and what kind of investing do you do? I got started in real estate. Um, Gosh, that's a long story for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, buying that piece of dirt and writing that bad check and doing what I didn't know I couldn't do, and which is why I could do it because I didn't know I couldn't do it. What are you um, talking about, man? <laughs> <laughs> What's the recap of the last show? That's the most cryptic thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> yeah, but now it's going to make everyone want to go listen to that show. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, um, yeah, it was absolutely not the way to start. And I think we spoke about that for, what, an hour and a half? <laughs> but at the same time, it's allowed me to invest in in houses, and I flip houses. I don't rehab them. So I think, Josh, you coined the word on the show, hoteling. So I guess that would fit probably my marketing and my investment strategy of what I do with these properties. I'm not a um, passive income earner. I'm a massive income earner. and um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a tweetable topic right there. That's funny. Well, my ADD gets in the way for passive income, so I enjoy buying houses and selling them for the as-is value without doing anything with them. And I buy them at 60 to 50% off value and turn around and and sell them at 100% of the value that they're at. That's cool. Gotcha. That's cool. Well, cool. Right so yeah, so yeah, we talked about that a lot last time, which is a fascinating model. And but but the whole idea behind, I mean, wholetailing as they call it, the idea predicates you have to have a good deal. I mean, like you have to because, I mean, you know what I mean? Like if you're going to go out and fix up a house, you can force, you can buy a, a halfway decent deal and put your own labor into it and fix it up and make a little bit of money off mm-hmm. of flipping. But if you're going to sell it without fixing it, that's a lot more tough. I don't see it as more tough, actually. I don't have to learn how to paint and I don't have to learn how to put carpet in or tile in or where stuff is at Home Depot. Yep. I don't have to be there at 6.30 every morning and I don't have to worry about if I have figured out my cost correctly uh, because I'm not doing any of those items. And I don't know if you two have ever spent hours upon hours in Home Depot looking for a bolt or a screw (laughs) or a paintbrush type or what have you. Josh, that is outstanding cool. I was just trying to put his sunglasses on, his (laughs) Ray-Bans. Wow. He did look like vanilla ice there for a second. (laughs) <laughs> I've got funny. this horrible glare outside my window and I'm trying to decide if that's the way to do it. So it's either Ray Charles or vanilla. Ice <laughs> <laughs> Home Depot. Yes. I, I I've spent many, many hours looking for a, uh, yeah, it's no and, fun. And, it's no fun. So when I look at the opportunity to have an opportunity I always look at it, how do you get there? I mean, you, the phone doesn't ring by accident. It's not like they're, they're wrong phone calls, you know, Someone doesn't ring trying to call their aunt and then all of a sudden they get you by mistake and have a house to sell. So we do all these things on purpose when we have that end goal in in mind. And um, the prospect for a wholesale deal or a flip deal or a a rehab deal or a hotel deal, they look the same. They all have to have an equity base. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get to that, right? They all have to have an equity base. So in order to get an equity base, we've got to find a deal that's a quote, distress deal. And, you know, as you were saying, we've got to get the phone to ring. So how on earth do we get the phone to ring? And that's really the subject that we wanted to cover today with you. So I, I know that you're, you're probably one of the folks that people on bigger pockets and probably elsewhere uh, look up to as, as one of the, uh, you know, one of the better marketers out there. Uh, so let's get into the topic of marketing. And, and I, I guess we'll start with kind of your bread and butter, at least what I believe to be your bread and butter, which is direct mail. So what is direct mail? Let's just, just start with that. In today's marketplace, I think direct mail is probably the number one marketing 
item that you can use. So we're, we're, we're taking something, a piece of paper, we're writing something on that piece of paper, we're putting a stamp on it, an address on it, and sending it through the U.S. Postal Service to someone, and we're hoping that someone has a desire to sell their house. We don't know if they are. I mean, if we only – if we had a list of the motivated sellers, we'd send out like two pieces of mail because we wouldn't need to buy any more houses than that. So we send them out mail, and, and then they call us back. And inside of sending out that mail, there are various types of mail and messages that create a response that we want to have created. In my market, I only want to talk to people that can actually sell me a house. So if I send a, a letter out to someone who's maybe upside down or has marginal equity – or just bought the house even though it's free and clear. I'm, you know, it doesn't make any sense to get, have them to call me, which is why I don't like, you know, the bandit sign concept because that, that's massive marketing or mass marketing, and you can't control who's calling you. Where I can control who calls me with my direct mail, which is the beauty of direct mail. Where, if we looked at 07, 06, in that time period, where a lot of sellers could call us and most everybody had equity, an equity base, we didn't have to use as much direct mail. We could use some of the other things out there to get callers. You know, the year that I, I did 200 deals, I think I spent, well, I know I spent 600 grand marketing that year. Whoa. Um, well, it's all relative. It is, I, mean, I guess. You, yeah. It's just yeah. amazing to think so that. So we knew that we were going to make $52,000 per deal. That was our goal. Uh, or 25%, whichever is greater. So at $204,000, it turned from 52000 to more. Anything under 204000 it turned from the 25% to the fifty two. So, you know, you take 200 times 52000 what is that? And you, in your market, yeah, year. in your marketing should, you know, <laughs> it should it should start out somewhere between eight to twelve percent, depending on what you're wanting to achieve and and what your goals are. It could get up to twenty to twenty two percent. Hey, Michael, um, really, really yeah. quick. So you're talking eight to ten or up to twenty two percent of what? Well, of your spend. So if I spend a dollar, I should get eight dollars or twelve dollars back. Got it. And eventually, I know I'm going to get twenty to twenty two dollars back. So you're saying for every like dollar spent, and specifically on on marketing, on marketing, right? Okay. On marketing. And marketing, you know, it looks like a lot of different things. Right. I mean, most people don't realize we are marketing. I mean, we are, we are a media here. And a lot of people don't use themselves as a marketing tool, but it's one of the best marketing tools that are out there. I mean, it, you know, if someone asked me today, I have $500 and I want to get started in real estate investing, what do I do? Do I send out a postcard? Do I send out a yellow letter? Do I send out a zip letter? Do I get a bandit sign? What do I do? And my goal for them would be over the next 30 days, write down everybody that you know who lives in your market that can influence that market. So they have a house or they know someone that has a house. Write down their name, their phone number. If you have their email address or their physical address, great. When you get that list done, divide that list by 22 because we only want to work during normal work hours. A lot of investors think they have to work all the time and they don't. This is a business just like any other business and we have 22 days a week. I'm sorry, 22 days a month you should work. Take that list, divide it by 22. So now you have, if you have 220 people on your list, you have 10 people a day that know you, can actually say hello to you, that you can call on the phone and say, Josh, hi, this is Michael. Just want you to know, after a long and careful consideration, I've decided to be a real estate investor. And I, was, I knew that you would want to help me out. And so I wanted to let you know and, and send you a business card of mine. And you know I buy houses from this person and that person and those kinds of people. So if you come across anybody that you know that needs to have my service, can you give them my information? And if someone were to do that, and that's free, all you have to do is buy a 1,000 business cards yep. or more. They would never need another marketing piece. They wouldn't need yellow letters. They wouldn't need bandit signs. They wouldn't need TV, radio, newspaper, anything else. The problem with that is what I call that sweat marketing and network marketing and when people do that, they also can't go on vacation because their business goes with them. But in the beginning, if you only have $500, I think everybody should start doing that. But, you know, they're embarrassed as well. If they can't tell mom and dad that they're going to do something else or, or wife that they can do something, they're going to do something else or their boss that they want to take on this other adventure or venture because maybe they sold Amway or life insurance or Tupperware or whatever it was and they failed at that. So they've kind of cried wolf. Well, get over it. Everybody has failures. I mean, let's say all of us raise our hand on failure. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, if you have failure, that means you just have to get back up again. You know, falling down is just right before you get back up. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I agree. I think, I think that's a great technique. And, and I know when I was a real estate agent, 
I followed something similar. I, I literally put together a list of everybody I knew and just started calling, you know, started working the phones and, and it was a great way to get clients. I think a lot of people, again, end up in that fear mindset where, or embarrassment or something else where they, they just say, Hey, well, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe they're going to reject me. Well, you're going to get rejected a lot in real estate. So you better start well, learning. Yeah, and, and rejections are actually not necessarily rejections. They're a step towards um, doing a deal. So aren't, isn't it just like a, another step in the process of getting a contract stein, signed? Oh, sure. So I don't look at it as a rejection as a negative thing. Um, say no to me. That is great because you say no to me. That's one step closer to a yes. Um, and by the way, I learned this lesson the hard way for anybody on the phone. You know, just because we preach it doesn't mean we always use it. And yeah. which, which is the hardest thing when you're trying to help someone, it reminds us to do it ourselves. And so my gardener, who was mowing the lawn on one of my houses, his real estate agent called me because I had a for sale sign on that lawn. And the real estate agent, now this guy's my gardener, called me and wanted to write an offer on my house for my gardener. Nice. And I paid my real, my gardener's real estate agent $4,500 <laughs> to sell my gardener my house because <laughs> I didn't tell my gardener all he had to do was come to me directly. And shame on me, but we think about that. How many times does that happen? How many times do we have a conversation with someone who says, yeah, I knew a guy, they sold a house last month to a real estate investor. Well, why didn't I talk to you last month? What was it about me that stopped me from doing that? And it's just all about marketing. Yeah. Um. So, uh, so I'm curious. I mean, I think that's a really good point. I don't want to like, just move on. But I do have a, something like you said earlier. And, and I love the gardener story. I yeah. think that's fantastic. And it's true. You know, I think we have to remember to talk to everybody, talk to everybody because you don't know who's investing and you don't know who that next sale is going to go to and the next deal is going to be with. So I, I love that. Well, and, and I can definitely identify with what you were saying about the, you know, maybe you sold Amway in the past or maybe you did. I mean, I never sold Amway, but you know, like the idea of I've, I'm a, I'm a dreamer. Is that the right word? Like an entrepreneur, maybe whatever. I like, business idea. So when I told my parents back when I was 21 that I was going to be a real estate investor, like they thought I was, you know, crazy or just, you know, grabbed a random get rich quick scheme book or late night TV thing. And you know, what I mean, like it, it was almost embarrassing, right? Like they just thought, oh, it's just Brandon, another one of his goofy ideas. So I can uh, definitely identify with that quite a bit. You know, and, and everybody has those. And I always tell people when those, those, those naysayers or those people that you're afraid to tell, those are perfect people to tell because if I can get – if I can talk to my parents um, and tell them I want to do something, then they, they're going to – and want to laugh at me kind of thing or if I'm embarrassed to because I think they'll laugh at me. But if I can talk to them, tell them, and handle all of their objections, first, they love me, so they're never going to get mad at me. Secondly, but when I handle their objections, that tells me I'm one step closer to being able to handle the seller's objection. And so we need a bunch of those people. You have to role play a lot. When you market, when you send out anything, you put up a bandit sign or send out a yellow letter or a postcard or whatever you do. If you're not ready to receive the prospect's call or opportunity, don't do it. I mean, so you're standing in the grocery line and you're wearing an I buy houses t-shirt or shirt and the guy or the gal in front of you or behind you say, hey, so you buy houses? If you don't know what to say when they ask you that, and if it's not a canned response, and it has, it can't be canned like you're reading it on the, by the, on the, like a back of a food item. You have to say, my name is Michael Quarles. I buy houses. I buy from these people, these people, these people, these people. I do all of these things for them. And if you don't close with those things and tell them the story, well, shame on you for marketing. Shame on you for wearing that shirt because, because that's why we're doing it. You know, you know, it's funny. I, I wrote a post about that exact thing the other day uh, on the Bigger Pockets blog. It was called "How to Write the Perfect Elevator Pitch in Under Ten Minutes," and yeah. whether or not like my strategy for writing a pitch is exactly what everyone should do. I mean, people come up with their own ways. But my point with the article was this: was that for f like five years, that exactly was what happened to me. I mean, people would say, "So what do you do?" And I mean, this is what I would say: I'd be like, uh, "I um I invest in real estate. What do you do?" I mean, that was my thing, right? Like that was my pitch. That was how like I explained what I did in life. And like now when I look back, I'm like, man, I was so stupid. It only took me 10 minutes to sit down one time, come up with a list or come up with kind of a canned sort of canned response. But again, not like, you know, I'm reading it, but come up with just an answer to that question that 
would uh, help me out in my business and and maybe help me raise money, help me find deals, whatever. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll put a link to that in the uh, show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 81. And uh, but yeah, definitely check that out if you want to know how to do your pitch. But to, to go back to something you said earlier, too, you said somebody will come to you and say, I got five hundred dollars. I want to get started with, uh, you know, real estate investing. How do I get started? And you said, you know, make the list, which is awesome. So let me kind of rephrase that question. How much money do I need to get started with direct mail? We'll go back to the direct mail topic. How much do I need to get started? Will five hundred dollars do it? Will five hundred a month do it? What do I need? Before you can, we can, before I can answer that, I have to know what someone's objective is. So if their objective is I'm going to buy and hold and I'm going to buy at 100% value and I'm going to finance all my purchases and I'm not looking to buy equity when I purchase, then that takes a limited amount of money. Yep. You literally, you can, you can finance your marketing within buying the house because they allow real, – I look at MLS and what realtors get paid. Some of what they get paid is for marketing. And so you can basically finance your marketing dollars. So in, in that case, you don't need much at all. Yeah. Right. Yep. yep. But if you're going to do shorts or if you're going to do lease options or maybe marginal sub twos where you're not putting a lot of money out until you have to perform on the shorts situation, that takes less as well. And I always looked at it and said, told people, what do you want to make? How do you want to make it? So I want to make $5,000 per deal wholesaling. Okay, so how many of those do you want to do? Well, I want to do 17 of them. Okay, well, can you do 17 of those in what period of time? Well, I want to do that monthly. Okay, so you want to make $85,000 monthly doing 17 wholesale deals that you make $5,000 on. They say yes. I said, okay, it's a, keep in mind, it's a one tenth multiplier. So yeah. if you're $85,000, multiply it by 10%, that's what you're going to have to spend. No, but what if I, I want to make $100,000 in equity that I can flip? Fantastic. You have to spend $10,000 in marketing to earn that 100000 And that is the truest number there is, irrespective of if you're a marginal person, a flipper, or a wholesaler, or a wholeteller, you're going to spend 10% of your, your whatever you want to make in marketing. Gotcha. If you don't, you could get lucky. There's you know, a ton of people out there. That you know they'll send out 300 postcards and they'll get a deal. But do you want to have a business that you can get lucky with, and it's only sustained by how much luck you have, or do you want a business that you can say it's going to come in here every month? It's going to be a membership business. Every month, someone's going to give me a membership due. We just call them houses memberships, but every month that's the business I want. And so if I know I have to have an on-purpose, predictable business then I know I have to spend marketing dollars. And yeah. I know the marketing dollar that I spend today won't entirely benefit me today. It will come back to me in a year from today. Yeah. Um, so, and then when you, what most people don't realize is, remember earlier we were talking about, well, how do you start with, and you, know, you build that list of your center of influence is what it's called? Well, in, in fact, if you read on Bigger Pockets, which is an outstanding website. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Well, it is. And I don't know if the two of you have ever visited anybody else, any of the other arenas that are out there. But, it, you know, I do every once in a while just to become so happy that I'm on bigger pockets. It's like, you know, you look at, and I'm going to take this personally. I'm going like, I, I, I see my fiance and she's a beautiful female. But then I, when I go <laughs> see, but when I go look at a, like, not so beautiful female, I'm really happy with my fiance. <laughs> so, so what, what, what you're trying to say is a uh, bigger pockets is a beautiful, beautiful female. female. Clearly. Yeah. It, it, well, it clearly, <laughs> as, it, as it compares to the other places that you both know are out there. But anyway. Gotcha. Well, so, so, so I, wanted, a, I, I wanted to, uh, sorry to cut you off. I wanted to kind of dig back on, on the 10% a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, I think one of the things that I see and have seen over the years is you get these new guys and they think, you know, they, they think that they can start doing deals with very little money, which they can do. And we've talked about ways that you can kind of do it. Uh, and, and then when they hear about the cost of marketing, they scoff and freak out. And, you know, I experienced that as well when, when I was an agent where new agents would come in and they say, well, I don't have the money to be an agent. How the, you know, how do, how am I supposed to do this? 
and they don't want to do the legwork. They don't want to do the sweat equity stuff. And so they're stuck in this position where, well, how the heck are they going to get any business? And they, of course, are the, you know, I don't know what the failure rate, on, uh, failure rate is on agents, but it's extremely high. At least I would guesstimate. And, and I think the same applies to investors as well for the same purpose. I think there's an unrealistic expectation of the amount of either sweat equity or costs that it takes to really start finding really, really great deals depending upon where you are, right? So if you're in an area, yeah, we talked about people in Milwaukee. Well, you can just look on the MLS and you're going to find great deals, but you're in, you're in Bakersfield, right, uh, Michael? Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, in, in Southern California, mid California, deals aren't falling off the MLS. You actually have to work to get those deals and the work is either money or sweat. And so I always try and tell people you have to have a, a good expectation and you, ha- you know, we'll have people who'll say, Hey, I want to start today and say, Oh, cool. Well, how much money do you have? They're like, Oh, I don't have, I have nothing. I'm like, well, why don't you get a job? Start building up a, you know, a, I mean, you could certainly go the creative route and that's, that's a valid way to go, but why not get an actual job, start building up reserves, uh, so that, You've at least got cash in the bank, whether it's for marketing, uh, for flipping, for anything else, just to have something. You know, I always, um, if I can go back to your statement of the attrition rate in real, for real estate in, um, agents, because yeah. it is large. You rarely see that second year or third year agent. Right. But once they become one, those are the successful ones. It's so, so if you can last 18, 24 months as a real estate agent if you haven't fallen off because of lack of funds. Then by that time you've learned what you didn't know. Yeah. So you can start learning what you don't know. You know what you've learned now, what you don't know. Oh man, you're um, confusing us again. <laughs> so, but you, wouldn't it be nice for real estate investors if we had that same opportunity? Yeah. Where we, if if we could go work for you know not the broker investor but the guy or the gal and say I want to learn this business. I don't. I just want to learn it. I just want to be around like-minded people. I want to learn. I, I want to learn what contracts are about. I want to learn learn well why you sit at the up desk or how do you what do you say to somebody or, but we don't have that in our industry. Right. I mean, we have all the people that call themselves mentors and gurus and those kinds of things. Um, You're talking about real great. mentors. You're talking about actual right. mentors, not the salespeople who who right. uh, label themselves mentors. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's that was in a real advantage for me um, in the middle of my career. When I did go get my real estate license and I sat at the desk and I watched the people filling up their coffee cups and hanging out at the donut box. And I was asking myself, why aren't these people going to work? And But they were at work. That was the problem. They were at work, but they weren't going to work. And I learned real fast that you know, in our life, all we have to do is want, have the drive to succeed, watch people who are successful and do what they do. But most people watch someone who's successful and only want to do a part of what made them successful. So it's like, okay, well, I want to be a race car, but I don't want to put gas in my tank. Well, I can't. You're not going to succeed. Yeah. Right. And we have to kind of do everything that everybody that's succeeding is doing. Well, and, and um, I think that's interesting when you talk about the the real estate agents that were just kind of standing around and eating donuts and drinking coffee. And I see that, you know, in the real estate world as well as, you know, they'll, I don't know, they they spend hours on their website or on I don't know, business cards or designing the perfect business card or designing the perfect whatever. It, it's like this idea of like, I feel like I'm being productive. I feel like I'm working. I feel like I'm making moves, but I'm really not. All I have to do is actually go out there and do some work. And I, I see that time and time again with people, especially brand new like wholesalers or uh, house flippers. I just, I see it all the time. Yeah. And, yeah. And you and, hear, and you hear about it. I mean, you hear about guys who'll say, Hey, I want to get started and I want to work in Bakersfield. Well, what do you know about Bakersfield? I, I I don't know anything about Bakersfield. Well, you know, what do you know about you know what area do you want to target? You know, where do you want to farm? I don't know. Well, get down, get out, get in your car, get on your bike, get on your rollerblades. I don't care. Just get out and and get to know an area, and then you could start working on it and figuring it out, right? I mean, that's well, just well, it, it, time. It, it's it's easier than that. And you know, when we when we buy houses out of town, um, and we don't have legs on the ground out of town, but you know, Google, you can, you can drop down, you can see the house. Right. Trulia, um, and then I have some other data sources that allow me to actually see a lot of history on the houses and see the houses that are on the market and what have you. Being a broker, being a member of the board, I can join a, join a board in California for a thousand bucks kind of thing. 
So I can get all the information that I need, but what I can't get is that that feel for value. So I can look at a, a CMA and I can say, this is the value of that house, but I, I haven't seen the house except for the outside, but I don't have a feel for the street because I've never been to that street. So all I do is I just call a real estate agent, three of them, Prudential, Century 21, someone else kind of thing. And agents will actually go out and look at houses for me for free in hopes that I'll list the house with them once I buy it, which I would, and give me a complete write-up on the house. And they'll do all my work. And I, I love it. I wish there were real estate investors who were like real estate agents. I wish there was a place we could go as in, as investors who seriously buy houses and say, okay, I have four people in, in Baltimore that I could call up and say, go look at this house for me. Yep. But we don't. Uh, well, two things. One, CMA for those people who are listening and don't know is comparative, I believe, comparative market, market. analysis. And, and that basically will just kind of give you a, it's a, you know, it's an analysis of, of the area around a property, uh, essentially. And then to your point, I mean, that really is kind of what bigger pockets, uh, one, one of the great things about bigger pockets. And, and, and I know tons and tons of people use it for that very purpose. Hey, I'm thinking about going to Milwaukee. I'm thinking about going to Miami. Well, who's there? Let me talk to them. And now I have boots on the ground because I've, I've networked and, and used the platform to do that. So I think it's there, but, but I, to your point, I don't, I don't think there's, it's not necessarily formalized and, and it's kind of an organic thing more than anything else. And, and I think it would be awesome if there were um, a sh- more of a structure, which is, I think, what you're getting at, where a, you know investors are more willing to kind of take folks under their wings in a mentorship role. And maybe it was even formalized with, I, I don't know, I'm a certified investor mentor. Right. Um, something to that point. Yeah, it, from, um, you know, we were talking about direct mail marketing earlier. The cost of direct mail sometimes is larger than the ability to actually receive the leads and fulfill those leads. So just because someone can spend X amount of dollars doing it doesn't mean they actually can do it from um, lead capture and lead fulfillment. Yeah. But um, some of us don't have that issue all the way up to that lead fulfillment because that's where the boots on the ground really comes in. It's, you know, tell me what the house is. Tell me what the social network in that is, is, is doing. And um, knowing that, we buy more houses. Those those people that have a large marketing budget that would just plop themselves into any area, they would they would absolutely enter that area without a problem because they know the mail is not an expense because of the rate of return that it has. Um, and they buy more houses. And they put a lot of it, these new investors who are just looking for how do I get started? What mentor do I go to? That's the best mentoring program they could have is – Having someone who's marketing to their area, who doesn't know their area, and what you are is the gopher, which sounds horrible, but be the guy or the gal for me right there and tell me everything your eyes see. If I could put a camera on your forehead, <laughs> that's what I'd want. That's awesome. That is, that's awesome. That's I agree with you completely. Yeah, I agree. Hey, so you mentioned earlier about the um, the 10% we talked about that kind of you can get a you know, you spend ten, ten, spend a thousand dollars on marketing, you'll likely make ten thousand dollars. However, if I go and take ten thousand dollars right now, or let's say I go to take ten grand of my hard-earned money, and I go and buy mm-hmm. ten thousand, uh, I don't know, pieces of paper that say I want to buy your house, and I stick them in the okay. mail and I send them out to just like every door direct mail or whatever, you know, the post office, or just go walk around my neighborhood and give it to every house. Chances are, I'm going to not make my money back. I'm probably, if I'm just saying yeah, it to everyone, well, right? Well, we, we, we are still only about an 11% of our market. So in my city, I have 116,000 units. And by the way, if anybody's listening, know your numbers. I mean, it's really easy to learn in a city, how many houses do I have? How many houses, of, how many of those are single family? Of those, how many have been owned for four years or longer? Of those, how many have 30% equity or greater? Of those, how many have one to three bedrooms? How do we know those Answer, numbers? Like, how does somebody do that research? The easiest way is create an account with um, ListSource, whether you buy it from them or not. Um, once you create an account, which is pretty easy, you can actually go in and play with the data. You can't see the actual result, like the address and the name, but they'll give you the counts. And it, you kind of have to start with your counts. How many things do I have to market to? Well, so if I have 116,000 units, 
but I only have 21,000 units that I should be marketing to. What's 21 and 116? What's that ratio? One and six? Mm, Probably. No. Yeah, about one and six. Yeah, yeah. What percentage is that? 17? Uh, 18, I think. What did you say? What was your first number? About uh, one and six. Right. So, well, I have 21,000 and 116. Yep. So that's a so that's about eighteen point nine eighteen point nine percent. So, if I looked at all my in my houses, then I have eighteen percent that could be a benefit to me. Eighty two percent that wouldn't be a benefit to me. So if I went into a neighborhood and just handed out flyers or did every door direct mail, eighty two percent of it would be a waste of money, right? Yep. And so let's assume that a piece of mail cost a dollar. And so now you, if you sent out 100 of those, you have $82 that was a waste, and then you had $18 that wasn't a waste, but you really have $100 spent on 18 people. Yeah. That's an expensive letter. So that's what the beauty of direct mail is. In 2008, 2009, um, when RESPA came around again, and it's been around forever. Can I explain RESPA really quick? In like, um, it's basically the – the governing body that controls title companies and how they can they give things away. So, um, like in the old days of a title company, they they would buy you dinner, they would buy you stamps, they'd buy you stationery, they would buy you a car, they'd buy you anything that you'd ask them to buy you as long as you were a productive agent and right. you could send them money. What they determined was is because the seller and the buyer are the actually the two people that are actually paying for the cost of escrow and title and all that kind of good stuff. RESPA came in and says, well, you can only give limited things to these people for free because trying to entice them to do business with you because it's not them that's actually paying the cost of what you're selling. And so when um, they did all that and the um, core logic uh, merged with first American title and we started instead of using MetroScan, for our property searches, we now went to uh, the CoreLogic platform. The CoreLogic platform, because now they could charge for it and really and not give it away, because if you gave it away, it wasn't a worthy platform to, to build. Now they're charging for it, so now we know when people have equity, and it changed the whole marketplace from a marketing perspective. So Am you're, I getting too deep on marketing? Well, so you're saying that we can actually we can actually now tell how much equity somebody has. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Um, and the algorithms that they use, and they don't let us know what the algorithm model is, but the algorithms are pretty good. And when we have a, a fast increase in um, appreciation or um, decline in value, we have to adjust on our end when we look at something and say, okay, 30 is really 40 or, or 40 is really 30, depending on what, what's happening. Like in the old days, I, would, I wouldn't go equity less than 40%, but now I'm comfortable with 30 because I know 30 is 40 Okay. Yeah. Because the algorithms, the algorithms haven't caught up yet. And it, this is something through like list source, right? Is that is that core logic or are those two different things? Uh, list source and core logic do the same thing. Okay. All right. So people can go so to list source and they can actually like look for people only that have equity. Right. So um, and then we remove corpse and and trusts. Some people will still stick to trusts, thinking that trusts are owned by um, just mom and pops and not like minded people. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't like trusts, but uh, I don't market to trust, but that doesn't mean other people don't. Um, and I can, I, I can, I'm not even sitting on the fence of, of whether I would do it or not, but I do understand why they would do it. I would never sway someone from doing it if that, that's truly what their marketing or what their model is. So we're, we don't want to market to corps or LLCs. Gotcha. Um, hey Michael. Um, so yeah. Yes. So, so you're talking about marketing to folks who've got equity uh, that's that's kind of one target list, but there's there's other ways that people can go as well, right? I mean, we can target uh, folks in probate, we can target divorce, yeah. we can target all yeah. these other things. So what what do you find? Um, so uh, go ahead. I think the question that's coming is is what is the best prospect groups out there, right? I, I, or, I wasn't going to go there. I was I, I was actually going to. I say, was going to go there, but <laughs> well, well, I mean, I was going to say. I, I think they all probably work, and I think it's just a matter of becoming an expert on any one or all of those different ways and see see what you're best at, see what your marketing works best at in your area, I would assume. And, and you know, if you 
you know, try your hand at probates and you stick with it for a while and, and you, you're not successful, try another one and another one. I mean, generally at some point you'll probably be successful, I would guess. Um, but I, uh, it would be interesting to hear what, what, at least from your experience, uh, the, the best bang for your buck is. And, and maybe you could tell us about that. Well, um, being a guy, you know, I've, I've, I've mailed out to the inherited list. I've not marketed to the probate list. Um, at one point, I was really big on the uh, 306090 mortgage late list. Yeah. A bucket load of foreclosures, naturally um, equity. Absentees. Um, ab- well, ne- yeah, absentees. So there's absentees um, in general, and then there's absentees that are actually vacant. And then there's FISBOs with for sale by owners. Right. Um, and then the expired list, people that had a listing with a real estate agent that expired, um, and now they're off the market for a moment. Um, so I've, I've marketed to all those. But what I've learned in the marketing is they all are under the list of equity. So they – or I'm, I will back up. The ones that I want are also on my equity list. So, so I always tell people who come to me and they say, well, what do you think about marketing to expireds? And I said, it's a great market to market to, but pull your equity list first. When you get your expired list, cross-check your expireds to your equity. If you have an expired that has equity, that's the one you want to market to. Because if just because they're an expired doesn't mean they're a prospect. Yep. They're just yeah. an expired. So if you market to all of your equity list, you're marketing to everybody else anyway. You don't have to say divorcee on the equity list because, well, you can be a divorcee, but – you're also an equity owner, right? That makes sense. So equity kind yeah. of covers everything. It's kind of a it, it, it's it's the whole, it's like well, you start with equity. It's the it's the fruit bowl. Right. I mean, yeah, it it holds apples and oranges and all this, but it's still the fruit bowl. And so if if you're serious about marketing, you market to that group. And for the longest time, you know, everybody preached absentee, 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 absentee for a couple different reasons, and I get it. But I'm not preaching absentee at all anymore. Um, I think it's equally as good as an owner-occupied equity. So it's the mom and pop that has a house they want to sell to go move someplace else. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, for a while we were marketing to owner-occupied, where someone in, on the on the deed was 65 years or older and they lived in the house for 15 years or longer, and we put those filters on it so that. When that person wanted to sell, if, if they've been there for 15 years or longer, there's some deferred maintenance. So it's probably falling down. It was probably a family home, and now there's no family at home. So they don't need the four bedrooms that they had because there's just two of them now. Um, they're 65 or older, and this you know 2,500 square feet run-down home or, or home that hadn't been maintained is now ready to be sold. And then the other kicker is, is they typically don't need the money because their residence wasn't looked at as retirement income. Most people don't look at their personal residence as a thing they're going to retire with. And so there were deals to be made there. That said, if there's an investor that wants to do that, don't go out there and do that, you know, like 100 percent, you know, right out of the gate. Find out if you can actually communicate with that prospect group, um, because it's one of the hardest prospect groups um, from an emotion standpoint to communicate with. And so, but if you get along with them and you understand them, you want to help them, then absolutely do it. Okay. So you're saying, just so I can clarify there, like uh, we can market to anybody that has the equity, obviously, but if we want to, you know, I don't know what's the word is pair that down, I guess, into a group that you feel most comfortable dealing with. Right. Is that what you would advise then? Right. If, if, if someone wants to go out like your probate list, doesn't you know your probate list doesn't mean they even have real property. So yeah, the first thing you have to do on that is determine in the case is it real property probate or just a probate yeah. transaction. Well, yeah. if there's real property attached to it, the next thing I would look at, okay, is it at property on my equity list? Because if it's not on my equity list, there's absolutely no reason to go after that probate. Yep. Yep. Because they still have just because someone dies doesn't mean the loans go away. Yep. Yep. So yes. I mean it, so if that, I like thinking of it in that way. I never really thought of it because I do not like personally, I don't like dealing with certain types of people, with certain types of sellers. It, is, it bothers me. I mean, I, I don't know. I Maybe probate's one of them. I mean, I haven't done a lot with probate, but when people call me, like, I don't know. I just don't feel like that comfortable doing it because it's not my personality to be there. So it, I like that way of thinking of, of find the people that you, that you enjoy working with 
right. and then work like I enjoy working with out of town or out, you know, absentee landlords. I like that because I'm a landlord. I can identify with them. I can right. work with them, help them. I understand the numbers really well. Uh, and that's just what I do. And other people are really good at dealing with probate. Uh, I know people like Sharon Vornholt, that's her bread and butter. And right. she's good at like that. R- Sharon and Rick. I mean, if, yep. if I were going to get into probate, I would absolutely be bugging the crap out of those two people. Yep. Um, because they have, they have so much knowledge that they, re- they haven't even written down yet. I mean, and I don't think they're trying to hide it from us. It's just, you know, probate's not that big push. You don't see that that big conversation about buying probates like you do on some of the other things because it's not a preached um, prospect group by a lot of the gurus on their their weekend shows. Yeah. So people are always going after, you know, absentee owners, which is really getting overused. So pick a group. Make sure if you pick the group that the group also has equity because – which is the problem with bandit signs. But um, – one of the problems amongst being others. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I have bought houses because of bandit signs, but I've never put one up. And so if anybody wants to ha- if you, here's a little trick. If you don't want to put bandit signs up, but want to buy houses from bandit signs, put their phone number in the phone book or under 411 Google of I buy houses and we buy houses. So get two phone numbers, pay for the little white page ad, and say, I am, I buy houses, and I am, we buy houses. So, Because what happens is people pass these signs, and they all say, we buy houses, I buy houses. Every one of the signs say, we buy houses, I buy houses. With a phone number, they drive so fast, and it's, that thing is embedded in their brain. Now they would decide, I want to sell my house. They go back, someone's taken the sign down, or the city's cut the sign in half, they can't read the phone number, so they call information yep. for the I buy houses phone number or the we buy houses phone number and there your phone number sits. So what is it going to cost you? 25 bucks. It's like nothing, but you're going to get free leads because someone else put bandit signs up. That's interesting. It's kind of, yeah. <laughs> I never thought about the, the 401. I mean, people do the same thing with, uh, with online marketing, right? Like people go, they see the sign for we buy houses or I buy houses or whatever. And they go online, they type in, I buy houses, you know, San Francisco. And, right. People try to get their website to rank for that because that's what people type in because they see the signs. So again, you're piggybacking off of what other people have done uh, right. to make that work. And, and you know, the same thing applies for like I do a lot of not a lot, but I do a little bit of Facebook advertising. And Facebook advertising is kind of like bandit signs in that I'm advertising to everyone. I can't pick equity when I'm doing Facebook ads. So I get right. a lot of phone calls of people. Like the other day, I talked to a lady who owed 142 thousand on her house, and I went and looked at it, and the thing's maybe worth 90. And like I looked at it, and I'm like, there's nothing I can do for you. I mean, maybe I could try to work a short sale, but I'm not even. It was a two bedroom house. I can't even do anything with a two bedroom house. So, um, in that area. So anyway, I mean, I, I like that idea about direct mail being able to get a list, like you talked about, uh, a list that has equity that applies to the kind of person that you're interested in dealing with, and then you market to them. So that's how we we get the list. So then, how do we? I mean, what are we sending to these people? We got yellow letters, white letters. I mean, what are, what are what are our options? Well, there are pretty much five options when you look at direct mail. Okay. So we have the yellow letter, which can be – and for, for people that don't want, know what the yellow letter is, it traditionally is a – it appears to be a yellow tablet lined paper um, that someone wrote on that says, I want to buy this house. I'll call this phone number. It, it appears as though you've pulled it out of the, the yellow pad tablet, um, folded it in, in fours, um, and put it in an invitation envelope with a handwritten address on the front and a return address on the back, typically tucked into the back flap so you don't lick the envelope and seal it, um, stamp on it and send it in its mail. What it appears to the person receiving it is coming from like grandma or Aunt Jane or someone that they know because it's in an invitation envelope. It's cute, it's friendly, and it is going to piss the people off sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) But it's what it does. I mean, and that is actually the power of the letter because although it's pissing some people off, it's making some people happy. Yeah. So you have both emotions at play. Um, and so the, the yellow letter is a great thing to send out. I, I would always send it out in any marketing campaign I was going to do. And then there are zip letters where um, if you've ever gotten a traffic ticket or a, a, like a corporate check coming from a large company, it'll be inside of this perforated – envelope that you have to tear open and then the checks at the bottom kind of thing. Yeah. Or the, or the summons is at the bottom or the, the traffic tickets at the bottom. 
that, those get open. They're great because it looks like it's important enough to get open, and then you can tell the story. And then you have the postcard. And the, the postcards in our from in our industry, uh, where most industries, like uh, realtor industries, they'll do a lot of pictorial postcards. They'll put their picture on it, and you know they, they'll maybe they'll put some um, industry statistics on it, and then they're going to put some sort of other picture on it. Uh, so we call those pictorials. Um, and then you have text postcards, which is really geared to what we do in life from an investor strategy, that where we can talk to the prospect. And uh, strangely enough, the market for text postcards, and the text postcard is literally just written format. It's just on a yellow piece of paper, and um, sometimes they're on white, sometimes they're on blue, sometimes they're on pink, sometimes on green, sometimes on orange, mostly on yellow. And the reason for the yellow and the reason that the text postcard came about is it it appears to be like a um, notice from the um, post office, you know, oh. like you have a package yep. or something. Those are all your little yellow postcard kinds of things. And so those get noticed because the worst thing about a, a small postcard is they're four by five and a half, yep. um, which is a lot smaller than a lot of other things that's coming in the mail. And so we're playing off the color as a, a color associates to something that's important being a, a post office notice. Yep. But what's strange about the postcards right now that's happening is the industry is has a tendency to move sideways and up and down quite a bit. And we're seeing a lot of no phone number postcards. So so somebody oh gosh, sending I'll, a postcard with no I'll, f- I'll remove that statement. We're seeing a lot of postcards with phone numbers that are intentionally not being at, um, answered. And the messages on the postcards is I'm not going to talk to you. When you call this number, no one will talk to you. And um, the people that are sending them out are getting really great results on, on it. Um, and it's a phenomenon. I, it's hard for me to understand and, and wrap my brain around. However, I try to wrap my brain around anything that's working. So there's a reason, by the way, it works is because we're building such energy into this um, mystical thing that's going to happen when you call this phone number because we're telling them, Call this phone number. You have a, a recorded message about your home. Okay. Yeah. We don't even. We're not even saying on the postcard we want to buy your house, which is what most postcards say. Um, we're just saying we have a, an important message about your house. Please call. Um, and then they filter out through the voicemail of this long voicemail of why, you, you know, they wanted you to call them. And then what drops out of that is an a, an opportunity. But what stays in that funnel or is the ways of contacting all those people because all those people were on your prospect list, right? Yeah. Yep. So now you, you might have a bucket load of something else that you can market to. I don't know. So, so you're saying like then the, people call that to get the recorded number and then now we have their phone number and you can follow up with them. Is that what you mean? Correct. And then, and then some, some marker taking that phone number and then doing some SMS stuff okay, and, yep. and hitting them, you know, where if a postcard costs 36 cents, a text message costs, probably a tenth of a penny yep. kind of thing. And you can set those up on autoresponders and what have you. Um, I'm not so certain our industry is completely there yet. However, um, they are using a cell phone when they call, so they probably understand text messaging. Yep. And then the fifth piece, piece of mail is a professional letter, which typically has logos on it. It's that, that normal-looking, um, not invoice-looking, but normal-looking letter from an attorney kind of thing or – or yep. someone important. Um, and those, those have their place for certain prospects. Like if I was going to do probate marketing, um, and it's one of the stages in my uh, short sell marketing that I would do, um, but they don't have their place in all prospect groups. Like I wouldn't send, necessarily send one as my first line of um, marketing to an equity list. Um, it would be one of my later pieces. And I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that we should be mixing up our messages to all the, the prospect groups. I was just going to ask you that. Should we be sending like, because I'm assuming like if one of these worked industry standard for everyone, then we wouldn't have five, we'd have one. But because there's five different ones work for different people at different times. So you're you're suggesting to send a variety? Yeah, it's bigger than that. It's I um there was a question post on, on Bigger Pockets, that outstanding website we go to. Um, <laughs> I'm you know, I, I'm, I, I love it. It's like, I, I called it my mistress the other day and oh, <laughs> well, it kind of is. It's like my, you, if you think about it, it's, 
you can go have fun with this thing and you don't like feel guilty. <laughs> you know? And I that, can that's actually, our new marketing line. It's, that is it right there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, awesome. So anyway, but, so there's um, a thing on bigger pockets. There was a and someone, you know, were they were talking about branding and just sending out the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And I looked at the other side of the fence. Budweiser, no, Coca-Cola has 112 um, things you can drink. So they have 112 items that you can drink. So does Coke really need tab? That's one of the things they sell. Yep. But they have Diet Coke. Do they really need seven different waters? It's water. <laughs> no, but it's water, yeah. right? Yeah. Why do they need them? Well, it's real easy. They want the largest market share they can get because they know some people love tab. As bad as tab is, yep. they love it. And some people love Diet Coke. And some people will love the square bottled water. And some people will like the blue round bottled water. And it's just water. Yep. And they know, wow, if we want to talk to all of the people out there, what do we do? Well, we send them a yellow letter. We send them a zip letter. We send them a postcard. We send them a different type of postcard. And we send them a professional letter. And now we have the opportunity to speak to all of the different personality types that are out there. Because if we only marketed with the one thing that works, the yellow letter that works, to say, let's assume that works the best for your prospect group. If that's, but, but what's best? 7%? 8%? Well, what about the ninety-three percent that didn't like it? Yeah. Well, why don't we why don't we also market to the ninety-three percent that didn't like it? Yeah. yeah. And so we figure out, okay, what's the next chunk? Well, the next chunk's a text postcard. So let's get that one, and then let's get and sure we can't market to everybody because some of the people just don't like anything. Right. They're just not going to drink Coke hey, and stuff. Hey, Michael. So okay, so we covered the five five types, and that makes a ton of sense. What What are we saying? I'm, obviously, I'm assuming we're going to switch that up depending on where they are in our funnel. Um, you know, it, is this our first or fifth uh, letter to them? But in it, general, what are what, what are we kind of saying? And and I know you you had kind of talked about that pre recorded postcard, but what about the other stuff? And I know that's very generalized because you're going right. to very, be very specific depending upon the type of marketing that you're doing. But, but in essence, what are we asking these guys? What are we, what so, are we telling to these people? And, I, and I've, I've only done millions and millions of pieces of direct mail. So I only know <laughs> what I know. Okay. What are you trying to say? So, you know more than us? <laughs> no, but I only know it from, I only know this answer from the perspective of doing millions and millions and millions of pieces of mail. Right. I don't know it from the perspective of doing a thousand pieces of mail. Right. So my experience tells me irrespective of the prospect group, you mail the same thing, the same message, because our message is I want to buy your house. Now in a yellow letter, we keep it very simple, very to the point, very directed. We don't brag about our corporate, uh, or LLC statuses. We don't brag about that we're going to buy it in a trust. We don't tell them how we're going to buy it. We don't talk about sub two or lease options, any of those things. We say, I want to buy your house at this address, call this phone number. We can get a little bit more creative and add that I'm an investor looking to buy a house in your market, or my wife and I are looking to buy a, another rental in your market. Um, but what we, we don't want to do on the yellow letter is get it, make it so long um, that it loses the prospect in the first or second paragraph. Because handwritten um, fonts or live handwriting, if you took a, a, someone's handwriting that wrote, that's about a 21 font size. Well, we type it at 10 to 12 font size, so we can, we can only say about half of what we could say, so it has to be pretty short, or we just yeah. run off the paper. That makes sense. Um, Do, and, well, spe and hey, then, speaking, speaking of fonts, you mentioned uh, font handwriting. Um, is that, I mean, is that what people do? I mean, I... How does that work it, versus handwriting versus it, it, typing a font? In, in the old days, they, we, we would take a piece of white paper. We would handwrite the letter, um, leave a space for the address because I think the address ad, – adding, adding the address in the letter is more important than the name of the person in the letter. So I can say, hello, neighbor. I want to buy your house at 123 Apple Street, and the 123 Apple Street's better than Dear John. Okay. But if I can do both, I want to do both. And then, so we'd, we'd write this letter out and w whatever pen we wanted to use. And 
we make a copy of it. We then copy it on line paper, and then someone would come back that wrote the letter, and they'd write in the John and the one two three Apple Street, and it would truly look like it was entirely handwritten. And then um, I think it was Apple that came along with all of their fonting ability and and what have you, and created some great things. And now we have the ability to create our own fonts. And from our perspective, we've created eight or nine of them. And so we can really take now someone's handwriting and make the letter look really handwritten, but it's all fonted. Then we have the opportunity to say, okay, do we want a font address on the envelope or a handwritten address on the envelope? And I've done some um, tracking and determination and, okay, is it worth spending the extra money to have someone handwrite something or just font it all out? And it is not worth writing something on the envelope over just fonting it all out. Yes, you're going to get a better open rate, but are you not going to get a better close rate based upon the expense? So if I could, if let's call it a quarter to to have someone write an envelope out, if I could take that on a thousand letters, that $250 I would have saved and put more marketing out on the street. I now have more opportunity on the street to buy more houses because what we're doing is when we, when we buy a house, our cab costs are so large, which makes our profit so large, that it far exceeds the cost of going that other route. So when you run, run the numbers like that, it, it makes sense. I'm not sure if that was your question or not. But that's all right. Yeah, so, yeah that, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. I just it's want fine. to know more, yeah, more, dive more on, on the font thing. But yeah, we we have probably like, I don't know, 10 more questions, like specifically on direct mail that we want to fire at you real quick. Because these are really good questions um, that I want to get to, but we're never going to have time. So I'm going to fire the at you and let's let's do these ones like in fire round sequence sort of thing. Yeah, fair enough. So, all right, right. Re- ready? Here's the first one. All right. What are the top mistakes people make with direct mail? Not answering their phone or having an answering system set up. Okay. I like it. And, and then the right next to that one is not being prepared for either the lack of calls or the abundance of calls. Because a lot of people, because they just want to do something, they want to be busy, yep, but yep. they don't look at the end perspective, what the end goal, what's, what's it going to produce? When you send out 14,000 letters, are you prepared <laughs> for all of these calls? Yep. No. Yeah. Or if you only send out 50 letters, are you prepared for that? One. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes I think sense. that's great. It definitely yep. makes sense. And, and, and I think uh, I, I think it's great. I mean, that this this stuff is gold right here. All, all right. How many times should you repeat a direct mail sequence before you see results? And to kind of clarify that a little bit, I, I wonder if you could tell us through your data and your experience uh, for a deal for for the average person who's closing deals, is it the first piece of mail that results in a closed deal? Is it the third, the fifth, the seventh, or or is that just really going to vary so much? It varies a lot um, because w- what happens with direct mail is if, if an in- investor starts marketing into an area that's being marketed already, then their first letter isn't the prospect's first letter. Yeah. And so they're piggybacking on someone else's marketing, which is great. So we see a, a lot of in, in a bigger, larger area, we see a lot of benefit to someone who can jump in and start doing transactions on their first and second mail piece. But if someone's in a small area where they don't have their peer group marketing with them, then they're going to be, you know, that two to eight sequence kind of thing. And um, there was a day I was sending out 16 letters within a 30 day period. I would get to an average of nine before I could pull them off my mail piece, my mail, my mailing sequence because we did something with them. So wait, so you're you're saying you did 16 pieces in 30 days? Like you mailed them like every well, yeah, other day? But, we wouldn't do that today, but you know that's been part of my history. Wow. Today I'm mailing. Today I'm mailing. I, I call it my 17 cycle. If I have an address, uh, and this is important for people to understand, you have an address. So how long should you market to that address? You you market to that address until they sell to somebody else, or they no longer qualify to be on your list, and you determine if they're still qualified on your list every six months. So you pull your list in January 1st. And then um, July 1st, you repull your list. But in the meantime, during that six-month period, you've sent them eight and a half pieces of mail. 
And over the next 12 months, if they're still on your list, you're going to send another eight and a half pieces of mail. So you're going to be a 17 um, schedule on your marketing. So every three weeks. It used to be before we had this influx of appreciation or, or selling um, about a six-week cycle, but now it's a three-week cycle. We should be taking – when we should be moving when our market's moving. So as the market gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and it is, we should be marketing more often. Um, and then as it cools back down again, um, going um, backwards, we should never go over 90 days a, a, a product. Um, and some people look at their marketing budget. You know, someone, one of you asked earlier, $10,000, what would they do with it? Well, that's, you get, when you look at a marketing budget, you look at a 30, I mean, a 60, I'm sorry, a 90 day period of time. What can you do over the 90 day period of time? So if you have $1,000, you really only have $333 a month to market with. And then you have to be satisfied. Then you have to be satisfied that month one, that could produce you 10 times that amount. Month Or month two, it could produce you 20 times that amount. Or month three, it could produce you 30 times that amount um, where you wouldn't have gotten anything the previous month. So we should always look at that, but then keep going. So it's not like you do three pieces of mail and stop. You keep going and going and going and going and going. And then every six months, you repull your list. And if they're still on the list, then you hit them again. Yeah. If, and, or, and because you're st- some will, some will have sold to somebody else, which is why we redo the list. Yeah. Um, there's at that rate, because in most markets right now, they're turning inventory about 25%. Um, and that's, it's the lists are expensive. The mail pieces are expensive. The mail pieces start being more expensive than the list towards that six months. So you just get a new one. That okay. makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. So, uh, what what would you I guess suggest for people because we talked about piggybacking off other folks who might already be marketing? Uh, how how would people stand out against those the, their their competitors in those areas? You know, I mean, what if what if I'm in the same area as you are and I'm following? You know, I listen to you and I'm like, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about, and now I start doing it. I mean, is it just luck of the draw? Is it the message? Is it timing? Is it all the above? Um, there's there's I think there is luck even when you're skilled and you have systems in place. Sure. Um, because, because we don't know who the prospect is. If we would, if we did, we'd only send out that letter, um, or the motivated prospect. Um, but it starts with, let's say we have lead generation. So that's, that's doing something that puts a lot of something somewhere for calls to come in. But right at that point, it's how are we going to capture it? Because a lot, and that's where a ton of people fall down. It's like, so the call comes in, and they're at work or they're doing something else and they're doing something else. And then finally they call them back and I'm sitting at the kitchen table buying the house. Yeah. It's like, <sighs> and that's because you're answering the phone and the vast majority right. of other people you're saying are not answering their phones. Yeah. And you can you, prove this to yourself. If you're in a marketplace, look on Craigslist or look in the newspaper for people that say, I want to buy your house and, and call, call them, it. call them. And <laughs> I've, done, I've, done, answer. I've done that a few times just because I think it'd be funny to like call somebody and just like, yeah, like I want to see how they how they handle the call. So I do it from time to time. I call band at signs or call yeah ads. I've never had anybody answer ever. It's always you know, going to voicemail. It, there's been times, you know, I've sat at the kitchen table, gotten the, and to get the contract signed, and they, you know, they say, well, so and so was here yesterday, to, and he gave us a better price. I and the, you know, it beckons the call. So so and so was here yesterday, and he gave you a better price. Then why Ouch. am I here? <laughs> no, it's I ask him, well. Why didn't you buy it from them? Right. What yeah. What was it about them that you felt that they couldn't fall forward? Yeah, there there was an article they, I read on online the other day that said people. It was like a sales article on Entrepreneur.com or something like that, and it was about. It said people don't buy what you like what you're selling. They usually buy because of who you are uh, a lot right. more than. And I thought that was interesting. Well, which is you know it goes back to the the first podcast where yep. we were getting into how do you actually communicate with people. And some people t- took offense to that, which I was kind of surprised, but I guess that's normal. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's so valuable. I mean, how you really need to learn how to speak to people and, um, um, and what questions to ask and then ask the questions and be prepared to buy a house. And um, most people aren't. Yep. Yep. I agree. I think that's, 
I don't, that's awesome. Did, did Josh, did that answer your question? It totally did. It totally did. And, I, and listen, everything that we've dealt with, everything we've covered in, in this show so far, it's been fantastic. And, you know, truth be told, Brandon and I are sitting here on the shared doc that we've got all our notes on and we keep crossing things off the list. So even though you're not specifically answering them as we ask them, you're actually answering them as, as you uh, talk. So it's awesome. All right. So we talked about uh, voicemail a little bit earlier um, and you should try to answer your phone as much as possible, you're saying. However, you can't always, like you said, this is a job. This is a business. You don't work 24-7, 365. You can't answer your phone even if it isn't a job, 24-7. Yep. So always, you always have to have the backup plan in play. And sometimes the backup plan in play is answering your phone. And that's a weird statement to make. Because if you can't answer all the calls all the time, shouldn't you set a system up that the majority of the calls that you can't answer are the primary calls and the ones you can't answer are the other calls? Because if you can give everybody the same experience, then you have duplicatable results. What I'm not looking by, at, well, I, well, I, I think he's well, talking well, about having, you know, if you can't answer it, well, at, at six o'clock, maybe have, having a service that answers it either. Either a service, a voicemail, a system in play that answers the phone for you and carries out a, a, a series of tasks that you've set up in advance. And those tasks feed you something that you've set up so that you can fall forward. But even if you, you answer all your calls during the day, let's assume that's the case. You can't answer all your calls during the day. You're going to be at lunch. You're going to be sleeping, you're going to be doing something, or you're going to be on the phone talking to a seller anyway. So if you're going to send everybody else to a voicemail, then I think it's extremely important to set up that voicemail or that call service, answering service system, and make that as good as it can be, and then answer the calls that, that you want to answer. Um, but is give everybody it- I, I'm sorry to, sorry to cut you off. I, I was going to say, well, what does that mean? So is, are you talking about finding a way to actually filter the calls somehow before you – I mean, I, I'm imagining, which would be amazing, that there's some system that would actually – you could pre-program in all the phone numbers of, of the people that you somehow managed to get from the same list that you got from list source, say. And now when that call comes in, you know it's distressed seller A that's got – X amount of equity, and then it flashes, and you're like, "Oh, well, this guy, this call, uh, he barely had equity. I'll let it go to voicemail." I mean, it'd be amazing no, if that were possible. Yeah, it would be amazing if that were possible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's not. I'm saying is is um, most people don't spend enough time with their call capture system. Okay. And as equal amount of time that it takes to to set up that marketing program. You should set up your call capture system, um, gotcha. because you can't you can't market. I mean, you can't talk to everybody at the same time. And if you can't, then what's the best experience you can give them? And I think it's it really just depends on what your budget is. You can go to Pat Live or a company like that and have them answer. They absolutely have their negatives. You can go to a voicemail um, and either do you know really sweet, innocent, fast voicemail which has its negatives. You can do a long, drawn out why I want to buy your house voicemail, which has its negatives. Um, everything has a positive, but you know, there's ba- good and bad things with everything. You can live answer it as much as you can. You can, um, whatever you need to do. I choose in my business, um, because I think buying houses where you make 50 grand is pretty good that I choose to have staff members who sit there and they're paid to sit there between eight and five and answer my phone. And they're running off of scripts. They're doing the work that needs to be done with the call that comes in. And then at that point, uh, we can take it from there and actually go and find out if we have, a, have an opportunity. But I also know they're going to miss calls. So the calls that they miss, is go, they go to a, a voicemail system that has a, a short message that the person can leave, comes right back to those attendants, and they're told to call those people back within 15 minutes of that call coming in. Because we know that person's fresh, yep. and and then following up and set an appointment. Um, so assuming they answer the five questions right. So and then on weekends everything goes to voicemail, because we don't work weekends. And I know some investors that's the only time that they can work. So if that's the time that they can work, then they work weekends. I just wanted I've always wanted an uh, investment business that wasn't I wasn't a slave to my business, and that kind of seems like slave business. 
Hey, hey, so, Michael. So it's great. Good information. Uh, we, we're we're wrapping this thing up. We really have one last question for you, and and I think uh, a lot of people can uh, relate to this particular one. Uh, and and I think it's this explains why a lot of people don't answer their phones. Uh, okay. What would you suggest for a newbie who's trying to overcome the fear of answering their phone? Uh, how to actually go ahead and do it? You know that that first phone call is is petrifying for a lot of people. And so, what advice? Uh, do you have for the newbies who are listening about, you know, how to prepare for that call maybe or what to say or what to, what to have at the ready for that first uh, phone call? I always, I've always said that you should have a script and you should have the scripts on you. Whatever script you want to use. And we use a short one. We use a long one. And over my years of doing this, we've, we have three or four different scripts. But learn it. And how, you, how do you learn it? I think you memorize it, saying it. Uh, really fast, 10 times in the morning to yourself, and then 10 times at night to yourself. You'll learn it. Um, you try to memorize it, but it still needs to be your voice, your tonality, your way of speaking. Um, because you need to be able to ask questions without looking at something. And um, that fear is a great thing. We either have fear of being successful or we have fear of not being successful. So you have to ask yourself, what am I afraid of? Am I afraid that I'm not going to be successful or am I afraid of being successful? And if it's the, you know, so you play on that and you go, okay, it's not, okay. My fear is just fear because I don't know how to do something, but I want to be rich. Well, get over it. Uh, and just, you know, answer the phone, go practice, find something to practice with, you know, call strangers, go call, you know, three, one, two, five, 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 one, two, one, two, and ask someone to, you know, if they had a house for sale and, you know, they're going to say all kinds of things to you and hang up on you and call you your idiot and all these words. <laughs> and, and then, and then pick up the phone and do it again, do it again yeah. you know, yeah. practice, on, practice on people who don't matter to you yeah. so that when calls that you've spent money on come in that do matter to you, then you can talk to them. It's great advice. I mean, here, awesome. I mean you, the, these people have spent so much energy Mind energy, money energy, time energy to get to where they are at. And man, not being prepared is crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's, that's awesome. a great, great way to end this thing. That's great. Yeah. All right, Mike. Well, listen, we really, 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 really appreciate the time. We're going to skip the fire round. We're going to skip the famous four. We've, did, we've done those and we've done them within the last like month. So I don't really see any, any point. But this has been fantastic. We've covered a ton of content, a ton of material, and and uh, we really, really appreciate you uh, giving us the time. We also obviously appreciate you spending time with your mistress. That is bigger pockets, <laughs> of course. And anybody listening who has questions about marketing, direct marketing, Michael's always amazing. He's always one of the guys who'll jump in and and help out. So you know, feel free to do that, guys, on the forums or. Uh, obviously on the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 81. Last thing, Michael, before we kick you out of here, where can people find more about you? And and you do have a company that does this stuff, that does marketing. So feel free to give a, a quick little plug here. You know, we didn't cover marketing hardly at all. And, <laughs> and shame on shame on me for getting so long-winded because I'm, I'm passionate about it. So if anybody wants to really learn about marketing, all they got to do is call me. I told everybody last time to call Norma, and I, she now has a dartboard and a picture of me on her <laughs> wall <laughs> and darts. And so I have holes in my face from Norma throwing darts at me. Um, so call the office, ask for me. Um, they'll probably set you up a time to call to actually talk with me. You know, I'll spend an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. I will absolutely set up a marketing program for you that you can – fall forward with and I'll absolutely be honest with them. If if I don't think they should do direct mail, I don't I will tell them don't do direct mail. Or if they shouldn't do yellow letters and do a postcard, do a postcard. Because I'm not in it for my success. That's I'm already successful. I'm in it for their success. Yeah. And cool. let's make them successful. So just just call yellowletters.com and that I wasn't supposed to say and um, or maybe I was. Well, no, and, you, um, you, you can the, say it. You can say it now. We just, yeah, you know, we, we don't want the show to be a, a, a big old yellowletters.com. There you go. Check it out, guys. Yellowletters.com. Michael, thanks so yes, much sir. for your time. And uh, <laughs> we'll see you around on the site. See you around on the site. All right. Thank thanks, you, Michael. Guys. All right, guys. That was show 81 
of the Bigger Pockets podcast with Michael Quarles. I'm sure you guys noticed there was not a famous four, and we specifically did that because we'd already done it just a few weeks earlier, and uh, yeah, we didn't we didn't see the value of regurgitating said information to you. Uh, otherwise, uh, that was that was great, Brandon. I mean, I I. I was certainly impressed with the amount of information that, that Michael had to share. And as, as I always am, uh, he's, he's fantastic on the forums. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I like about Michael a lot is that he, he goes deeper than just the how to, right? It's not just do this, send this letter. Here's why you send it. Like Michael always goes deeper into like, what does it actually mean? Because a lot of times just telling people you need to send this X, Y, Z out doesn't always work. Uh, yeah. Everybody's got a different scenario. So he, I, I love that he kind of shares the background of, how, why we do things and how to do them, uh, starting from nothing. So great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, obviously we were kidding about it, but you know, some, some of the answers tended to be verbose, but I I think that's because he's been around for so long and has so much knowledge. And in fact, you call him old. I, I (laughs) am, I, yep. Now that he's not here, I'm calling him old. (laughs) What do you say about that, Michael? Um, no, He's been around and he knows, he, listen, he knows what he's doing. And yeah, it was great. So anyway, big thanks to Michael. Uh, if you are a Bigger Pockets member, obviously you know that you can connect and interact with Michael on the forums. He's on there pretty much every day, as he called it. Bigger Pockets is his mistress. And uh, you can find tons of other amazing, amazing, brilliant people hanging out on Bigger Pockets, their mistresses as well. Uh, sharing lots of great information. And for those of you who are not, that's why you need to be doing it. These guys, these folks are really, really good people. And if you're not on there engaging, asking them questions, picking their brains, you're you're missing a lot of the fun and you're missing a lot of the value of the site. So definitely encourage you to do that. You know, it, it kind of breaks my heart sometimes. You'll see guys who jump on the site and they'll participate for like a couple days and then you never hear from them again. And then, you know, you'll, you'll find out three, four, five months later that they quit the business and yeah, you'll ask them, Hey, what happened? Well, I just, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have the support. I didn't have this. And you're, you stop and you say, well, you have this monster support group. You have all these people who can mentor you and help you and, and, and be there to, to guide you. You know, if you're sitting there silently, you're not getting that. So Here's my reminder to anyone listening who's either not signed up yet for Bigger Pockets or who's on Bigger Pockets and hasn't really stepped it up and started to connect with people. You got to do it because you're going to find so much value. You're going to find so many great people to help you and help you grow your business. So I definitely encourage that. Sorry to go on and on, but I'm, I'm really passionate about this. And it's so exciting watching people's uh, businesses grow because of their participation on our platform. Uh, with that, as always, like to remind you, we've got our Facebook, our Twitter, our G+, our LinkedIn. Uh, definitely jump in, follow us there. We share all sorts of cool stuff and content and news and you know other other fun things. And and hopefully you'll you'll participate with us there. And beyond that, that's it. This is show eighty one of the Bigger Pockets podcast with Michael Quarles. The show notes you can find at biggerpockets.com slash show eighty one. And uh, I'm gonna let my friend Brandon take us out of here. Once again, Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 81 in the books. This is Brandon and Josh signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from biggerpockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.